Hey, hello. <laughs> Welcome. Um, I'm really glad that you're interested in a possible degree in education here at Ohio State Marion. Um, I'm Linda Parsons and uh, Dr. Marcus Herzberg is here as well. And uh, we're going to talk to you about what it's like to be a student here in Marion and also specifically in the education department. So I'd like to start off uh, with uh, a little introduction to some of our faculty. Um, oops. So we are gonna be talking about teaching careers, uh, both options and opportunities that you have here in Marion. I know that you can see our faces, but I thought I'd show you us a few years ago. Um, <laughs> once again, you know, I'm, I'm uh, Dr. Linda Parsons. I'm an associate professor and also a middle childhood literacy specialist here. I teach uh, classes in literature, uh, literature of diversity, and a lot of other um, courses related to either learning about literature or using that literature in the classroom. And uh, Dr. Marcus Herzberg is a senior lecturer with us. He has taught, I believe, on every Ohio State campus. And I'll let him do just a little um, blurb about him. Go for it. Uh, again, thank you for joining us. Uh, and um, yeah, so I've, I've, I have taught at each of the Ohio, Ohio State University campuses. I got my PhD on the Columbus campus. Uh, and then I um, have taught uh, for about the past 20 years, uh, a little over 20 years at um, Ohio State. Uh, I've been here at the Marion campus for about 11 or 12 years, uh, and I teach a variety of, of uh, classes. Um, one of the ones that uh, uh, the first, the first, I, I'm oftentimes one of the first faces that uh, students see because I teach the FEEP course, which is uh, the early experience course where students um, start to explore education as a career field. They get to do a field experience uh, in conjunction with that course. Uh, and we talk about some of the important aspects of education as well. Um, so again, very glad that you're here and I'll kick it back to Linda so she can, she can give us some more information. Yes, and I did want to introduce you to some of our other faculty. Um, I think if you come to the Marion campus, you're going to find uh, that it's just such a welcoming and warm campus. Um, I tell everybody that I have the opportunity to say this to, we're in the best of both worlds. We are a small, it feels like a small liberal arts campus, and yet we're part of the Ohio State University. And uh, this picture was taken uh, during one of our freshman or incoming student welcome days. And I just wanted you to virtually meet Dr. Ina Apova. This is Dr. Apova. Uh, she is our math educator. And then uh, Dr. Julia Hagee is here in the middle. And uh, she, is, um, she is another reading specialist. So you would see us. You do not have this guy for classes. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't me. That wasn't me in, in, in costume or anything. No, no. no. So um, what we'd like to do is take you through some of the opportunities that um, a degree in education uh, would provide. And we, we have two... Um, kind of tracks, if you will. There are two different uh, degrees. One is a degree that is a non-licensure degree. In other words, and I'm going to share with you what that will, uh, what that will do. Um, this page actually says that it is an early and middle childhood studies degree. Uh, this has recently been changed. The name has been changed to Child and Youth Studies. This is a degree that would prepare you to work with children in lots of different um, venues, not as a teacher in a classroom. Uh, but you can see here that, uh, you know, you can move into industry, into some of the health professions, 
um, into some nonprofits and also some government um, agencies. Dr. Herzberg works very closely with the Child and Youth Studies Program. Um, and is there anything you'd like to add to this? Uh, no, other than uh, just to reiterate what you said, that it's it's a um, it's an opportunity for students to to find career paths that. Um, have to deal with education, but as you said, are not licensure programs. We've had students do very, very well uh, in that program. Um, many of them, when they when they do their final internship, uh, we have uh, very good students and they're very impressive and many times end up landing a job either at their site uh, of that internship or um, uh, at, at a, a similar type of institution. We have uh, students who have uh, done internships and then landed jobs at uh, COSI, the Columbus Zoo, um, uh, uh, various government agencies dealing with the environment, um, museums, um, United Way agencies. Uh, so so it's, 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 it's a really, uh, you know, a great opportunity, I think, and we, we've had many students do, do well with that, so. So this child and youth studies degree, which is non-licensure, is one path that you might want to follow. Um, another path would be to actually uh, work toward licensure. This would give you the opportunity to move into a teaching position, uh, either in a public or a private school, um, and I wanted to make sure I had the right one. Uh, even though we've been teaching virtually for how many months now, <laughs> I still forget to unmute. I still, you know, don't pull up the right thing. Um, did I pull up the right one? Yes. Um, so, so the other possibility is that you would get a degree and be licensed to teach either primary which would be uh, students from grades pre-K through five, or you would be licensed to teach um, in middle childhood, which would be grades four through nine. And even with a, uh, an Ohio, uh, even with a state teaching license, there are lots of opportunities to uh, take advantage of your degree both in classrooms, but also out of classrooms in other, um, you know, in other venues. And this just shows some of those. Of course, the one we focus the most on is this. We are preparing you to teach. Uh, we are preparing you to teach. So uh, the last thing I would like to share with you and talk about would be the licensure programs. Um, the state offers many different licenses, many different teaching licenses. Here on the Marion campus, we focus on two licenses, which I've just mentioned. We have the primary license, which would enable you to teach in grades pre-K through five, and we also offer the middle childhood license. For this license, you are not a generalist uh, teaching all subjects as you would be in um, with the primary license. You would select two areas to teach. Uh, most people usually pair language arts with social studies or they pair math with science. Although that's not a written, I've had people decide they want to teach language arts and math. And so, so you pick two of the four. We have two new programs. Now, now these two licenses you could earn completely through the Ohio State Marion campus. We have two new licenses though that you could earn in conjunction with Marion and another campus. One of those is the primary license plus uh, visual impairment. The schools are desperate right now for teachers who are qualified to teach students with visual impairments and uh, Marion partners with the Columbus campus 
so that these courses are taken across the two campuses. The other um, dual certification that we offer is in uh, collaboration with the Lima campus. And, um, and that is in pri the primary license plus a certificate to teach in the mild moderate uh, special education area. Uh, there again, you, you take most of your classes in Marion and some you would take virtually with Lima. Um, I should mention that all of the classes on the other campuses, uh, at least to date, are offered virtually. Um, so, so that's what you could do. There are many other uh, teaching licenses that are offered. Uh, many of them are offered in Columbus as well, but here on the Marion campus, we offer primarily those two. So with that, I would like, I think, to turn it back over to Dr. Herzberg. Uh, to talk more about, because we're going to push that teaching license. Uh, uh, yes. Um, and I would like to, there we go. I think we can see that pretty well. Um, one of the things that we talk about in my FEEP class, and I'll be talking about this tomorrow morning uh, as I have my first seminar with the students, um, is about teaching as a career. Uh, what it entails, the various professional responsibilities, um, uh, many of the benefits that you get from teaching, both um, you know, like job satisfaction and those types of things, but also uh, pay benefits and things like that. Um, and so I, I, I shared this with them, so I just assembled this to, to share with you. Um, uh, Ohio is a good place to teach for lots of reasons. We have um, uh, a, 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 a great population. We have a growing population, especially among um, school-age children. Um, and uh, it's, it's a good place uh, to, to teach for um, some of the material benefits of teaching as well. So uh, as I looked at a variety of different surveys um, in preparation for my, my, my seminar tomorrow, um, Ohio's average teacher salaries currently rank uh, in the top five in the nation. Some surveys put it at three, some four, some five, when you adjust for the cost of inflation. Uh, so you'll sometimes see uh, in uh, you know uh, news articles online or something like that, they will rank teacher pay, but um, that doesn't really take into account that um, you know while teachers in New York get paid quite a bit more than teachers in Ohio, uh, rent in New York is very high. Um, doing lots of things in New York is rather expensive, but uh, not that New York is in a great place, right? Um, but just you want to kind of compare apples to apples. And when you do that, Ohio tends to uh, compare very favorably. Uh, Ohio's public teacher retirement system, and I tell my students this in our FEEP seminar, even though they're like, you know, we're 35 years from that, <laughs> kind of, we don't need to talk about this now. Um, but it is uh, very well managed and very well run. Um, uh, and it's, uh, was actually ranked, uh, there's a story in the Dayton Daily News about a year ago that reported that it's considered the top retirement system in the United States. Um, teachers who choose the uh, defined uh, benefit option, which is about 90% of the teachers, it's, it's the pension plan, um, receive 77% of their top five earning years for life. Um, and I believe those years would, would include you know, your salary, but if you took on other responsibilities, coaching, uh, moderating clubs and things like that, um, that that would factor into that calculation uh, as well. So uh, 35 years in the system, 77% uh, for the top five years. Um, and the funds are uh, uh, well-managed. Uh, uh, STRS, the State Teachers Retirement System, has elections for representatives who teachers vote. Um, uh, it is watched, you know, politically by the press and the legislature and, and, and everything. Um, there are a lot of states that I've read about. Again, I, 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 I love New York, so I'm not going to mention any states, uh, you know, but um, there, there have been states that have issues with their state teacher retirement systems. Ohio has not been one of them. And in fact, it was revamped a few years back in order to make sure that it is solvent for uh, the next 30 years, I think is what they did. Uh, and then also that teacher's health insurance, which is a very valuable benefit. Um, 
uh, our teacher's health insurance typically provides significantly better benefits than those of workers in other fields, private fields at lower out of pocket costs. Now, um, you know, the particular insurance systems, uh, I'm sorry, insurance plans vary from district to district, but overall um, they tend to be um, uh, very high quality uh, at relatively low cost to, to the teacher. So all of those are, uh, you know, positives. Uh, as far as the job market or employment opportunities uh, here uh, uh, in our field, uh, the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics um, uh, tells us that the teaching field is expected to gain at about 4% a year for the next decade, which, which puts it in, in kind of like a, an average field. It's not you know, skyrocketing growth or something like that. Um, but it's also not sluggish. It's not slowing down, which is good. Um, the, the Economic Policy Institute predicts a shortage of about 150,000 teachers nationwide um, within uh, about five years, within the next five years. And some of that's based on retirements. Some of that's based on population shifts and things like that. So basically the, the, the gist of it is that uh, there are going to be jobs out there. And our students, I'll skip down to um, uh, uh, the next line that approximately 90% of our recent graduates um, from our licensure program have teaching jobs. Um, so, and, and some of the ones who do not have ch chosen not to. So uh, they decided to take a year off or, or do, do something else uh, 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 until they uh, re enter, say, enter the profession. For, uh, and uh, Ohio is also a good state to get your license because our standards are relatively high um, compared to other states. And through a process called reciprocity, when students gain licensure here in Ohio, they can then apply to other states and that licensure will transfer. And again, because Ohio standards are high, uh, we're sought after, our teachers are sought after if they would like to teach in, in other states. Of course, we want to keep them close, but uh, you know, sometimes, sometimes they, they want to go uh, other places, uh, Nevada, Florida, Texas, North Carolina, and uh, states like that that have experienced um, rapid growth in some of their uh, some of the areas of their state, and then also then rapid growth in their school systems um, recruit here. Nevada, when I got my I shouldn't date myself, but when I got my teaching degree at Ohio State uh, many years ago, um, we we already had recruiters. Um, uh, and, and that has con continued to be the case. So uh, that's a good thing for our students. Um, and finally, a couple of other things. Um, uh, e even with, um, you know, of course, we're in the COVID era and that, uh, COVID era and that affects things. Um, but um, in a 2018 teaching and learning survey, over 90% of teachers said that they were satisfied or very satisfied with their jobs. And that was actually up, uh, I think about five to 10% over uh, a survey that had been done uh, about uh, five or 10 years earlier. Um, so teachers tend to be satisfied with their jobs. Uh, and then there are other benefits um, that the US Department of Education offers loan forgiveness up to $17,500 for uh, uh, primary and secondary teachers who work in schools that serve low income families. Uh, and I looked at the list, I went to the website and looked at the list and that currently applies to most if not all of the schools in Marion County. So if students would get a job locally, it's depending on the type of loan they, they would get, um, uh, that, that could be an option for them. Um, so other than that, uh, I just thought I would share with you just a broad overview of how our students say move through our program. Sorry, uh, I clicked on the wrong. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna try this one more time. Okay, still on that. <laughs> I think that is what we were going to share. Oh, oh, maybe you're seeing something different than me because I keep having it share the course progression mm -hmm. and I'm not, Oh, I'm not seeing it. I'm seeing what I just shared, the teacher career fact sheet. Uh, we're seeing it. You're seeing 
the progression. Okay, that's really odd. Um, oh, it's technology. <laughs> well, I, I'm not. I'm not quite sure. Uh, here, give me one second, and I will close that. So maybe that it won't give me the option to share it. Uh, and I will see if I can get it to share what I want to share so that I can see it. Um, there, okay, got it. All right, I think we're in good shape. Okay, so what we, we've done here is just kind of laid out um, uh, a, a quick overview so that you could understand how students move through the program um, so that uh, we always have students get uh, an FBI or BCI uh, check over the summer. So students say, uh, prepare to enter the university and maybe graduate from high school, and then they're going to come here for their freshman year. Uh, they'll receive emails over the summer, hey, get your, get your FBI, BCI check. Um, so that, because many students take my course, FEEP, their, their very first semester or even their second semester on campus, and um, we have to have we have to have that done before they can go out into the schools. Um, and then they'll take some of their general education courses their first year and their pre-licensure courses. Um, those would include, I teach some of those other classes too. So psychological perspectives on education, for example. Um, and they may take some other classes um, uh, to fulfill pre-licensure requirements. Uh, and again, FEEP 1, most students take that their first year, but we do have some students who take that their, 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 during year two. Uh, so moving on to year two, again, over the summer here, you'll take the, the background check. Um, and then um, uh, you could either take FEEP 1 the first semester and then FEEP 2 the second semester, or some students take FEEP 2 in their, their second semester. Um, uh, FEEP 1, the course that I teach, the field experience is in River Valley Schools which is the local school district and FEEP 2, it's done in Marion City Schools, another local district. Um, so students will be doing that. Uh, they take the remainder of their general education and pre licensure classes. And uh, they typically will apply to the licensure program um, after or towards the end of, of their, their FEEP 2 course, though that sometimes varies depending on how many of the pro other um, uh, pre-licensure courses that they've taken. Um, but by year three, most, most students are in our uh, licensure program. Um, they will take uh, more field experiences, advanced field placements um, during their junior year. And um, uh, there's specific coursework they'll be taking um, for the program, whether they're early childhood or middle childhood or based on their area of concentration. And then they'll prepare for student teaching, which we have now only in autumn of senior year. So autumn of uh, year four, uh, our students will uh, student teach. Uh, prior to that, during their third year, uh, again, they would take the OAE test or possibly at the tail end of that year and over the, you know, the first month or so of summer, uh, the Ohio uh, assessment for educators, uh, they would have to pass um, uh, three tests for early childhood and four for middle childhood. Uh, our students actually do very well on, on those uh, uh, assessments. And we have uh, in say the last uh, five, six, seven years uh, added more and more support for them so that they um, again, perform well on those. Uh, so <clears throat> depending on the students, um, uh, how many co courses the students had, had taken, most students will complete their student teaching then autumn, and they, they may have a few additional courses to take, sometimes two, three, or four courses, which they'll take in sp spring of year four um, in order to complete the program and uh, graduate and apply for licensure. Uh, Dr. Parsons, was there anything you wanted to add to that? You know, I have maybe breaking news. Oh, good. Um, yeah, we have currently that you would apply to the licensure program uh, at the end of the sophomore year, but we are moving toward a direct admit. Right. And we're actually hoping that by this autumn, uh, students who come into the program will automatically be admitted um, directly to the major. 
uh, now there are benchmarks, you know, you have to keep your GPA up, you have to be making progress uh, in your coursework, but um, we're really excited about this uh, possibility of direct admit. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm virtually certain that it will be a reality, uh, hopefully by next autumn. Uh, the only other thing I was going to say is where we say, you know, you apply to student teach, you, you would apply, but that application is really just a confirmation that you have met all of the requirements. You, you've completed your coursework and you're ready to student teach. Um, I think we do have a rigorous program, but I can't think of anyone who was ever told, no, you can't student teach. <laughs> it's not that kind of application. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering, um, I mean, I wish that we had live prospective students here who could ask us questions at this point. Um, but I, I foresee one if you want, if you want me to because I forgot to mention something. Um, one thing I didn't mention, because students sometimes ask, how is your program different than another Ohio State regional campus or the Columbus campus? Actually, the program is the same. I mean, in, in, a, in a particular uh, um, uh, uh, program, so for, for early childhood or for middle childhood, <clears throat> the courses are the same, the requirements are the same, your GPA requirements are the same. Um, the difference is um, at uh, Columbus, they have a large pool of applicants, so they have to limit it to so many applicants, uh, participants in their cohorts per, per year. Um, uh, here at, at the Marion campus, we've never had that problem. <laughs> so, so, so we have, again, the same standards, but when our students meet that standard, uh, as Dr. Parson said, uh, you know, they move through the program. So they, they move on to uh, be admitted to the program. And then when they apply to student teach, they've met all the requirements, they then student teach, uh, and then on towards graduation. So the requirements are the same, the courses are the same. Again, I've taught on all the campuses. So uh, I can, I can vouch for that. Um, and so, so that's something for, for students to be aware of. So another thing I would add, um, Dr. Herzberg mentioned the field experiences. And I think one of the real strengths of the program here on the Marion campus is that not only do we have you out in classrooms every year that you're a student, but you're supervised in all of those experiences. And we have a group of supervisors who are phenomenal. They're all former teachers or former principals uh, from this general area. And, um, you know, so they come, they visit students. They're the liaison between the student and the mentor teacher in the field. And uh, we want to make sure that as you are doing field work throughout your entire program, um, you're getting the most you possibly can. Uh, the only other thing I would say about that is, you know, I've heard of these horror stories that someone had no field experiences until really late in the program and oh, decided they didn't want to be a teacher. You know, they discovered they don't like having kids. Uh, that's not Marion. You know, there, there are lots of field experiences. So, Ashley, are there questions you would pose that, you know, students tend to ask? Yeah, so um, hi everyone, I'm Ashley Marsh. I am representing our enrollment services team here um, for this session. Um, so I actually have someone very close to me that went through this program. I myself went through this program for a little bit um, and kind of chose a little bit of a different path. But um, a question I get a lot is honestly the questions you guys have answered. You know, where, where are they gonna student teach? Which, you know, Mar Marcus, you've already answered. And um, what does that look like? Or what happens if I decide not to, you know, become a teacher? Or am I going to be able to use these skills? So um, I honestly think a lot of what we get asked in enrollment, um, you've definitely touched on. Well, I, I would add this as I've been possibly too nice. Uh, I will say this about it. I, I will tout our campus uh, for uh, an, uh, uh, something else regarding what you just talked about, student teaching. Our students, as I said, you know, in FEEP 1 and FEEP 2, you have particular districts that you work in. Our students have choice. Um, 
for their their final field placement, their student teaching placement. They, they have some choice, I think, in their second field placement or their second advanced field placement. Um, but but they have choice in their student teaching. And I, I know um, when I re received my teaching degree at the Columbus campus, we had two districts that we could we could pick from, uh, and I think possibly even just a couple of schools in that district. Um, and I know that other uh, institutions uh, and other campuses don't offer the choice that that we do. Now you can't necessarily pick anything; it has to be approved by uh, our director of placement, Mr. Craycraft, who's another uh, great member of our team um, and does does so much to help our students. Uh, but but I think that's a big plus because it allows you at, you know, kind of the, the, as you're preparing to enter the career field, you can choose a place either that you might want to apply to um, once you get your, your license or similar to a place that, that you would um, apply to. And I think it's, it's a great benefit to our students to have that flexibility. I think another bonus too that we always talk about is you are being taught by faculty. So there, you know, you are face to face with them every class. I mean, things look a little different right now, but um, you're, you're very hands on. They're very hands on. They want to be in the classroom with you, which is why they teach normally at a regional campus. Um, so that's definitely going to be a perk as well. Um, it kind of at, at least starting on a regional campus, if not finishing for four years here is really going to be, you know, very hands on um, experiences with faculty. Yeah. So I was thinking about that very thing that um, as I think about what I love about this campus, because I teach um, a young adult literature class, which is typically taken early, you know, freshmen, sophomores, uh, and then I teach licensure level courses. <clears throat> and I've been fortunate enough recently to teach the student teaching seminar. So. I know many of our students from the time they're freshmen until they're ready to graduate. And I can't tell you how satisfying it is to watch someone go through their entire program. Uh, and, and so I do think, uh, as opposed to a larger campus, knowing that you're going to have a particular professor repeatedly, um, really is a supportive kind of situation. Just as you get to know the instructors, uh, we get to know you. And it's not like you have a, a, an instructor once and then never again. Um, so I think particularly if, if anyone who listens to this, maybe if you're a, a first generation college student or, um, or just, you know, not kind of real sure, you know, um, we, we just offer so much support for our students. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. I think that you've really given us a great overview of the program. Um, for students that are watching this that would like additional information, um, we'll make sure to attach both of um, their contact information to this, you know, so you can follow up directly or um, as always, you can follow up with us in enrollment services at askmarion at osu.edu. It's our more general email, but we check up on that daily. Um, thank you so much for watching.